Hello everybody, um, I'm back with another video, and today, you are gonna be excited. We're gonna ride a choo-choo train, choo-choo train, choo-choo train, choo-choo train. Okay, see you there. That represents the southernmost point of the continent of the United States. Before you ask, no, I cannot drop you off directly here. That buoy is 90 miles from Cuba, it is 157 miles from Miami, and for now, we hope it stays this way for a very long time, because it means we're still legitimately a small town. That buoy is 128 miles from the nearest Walmart. Yeah. It's a road. <laughs> Last time I read, as well as the southernmost, southernmost house, this is built 18 inches further south than the southernmost house, and the other one is still called the southernmost house, so that's how this one got its name. Regional southernmost house coming up my right, big beautiful Queen Anne Victorian home with the red Cuban barrel tile roof. It was built by J. Binding Harris, the other house in Iowa with the full basement. J. Binding Harris was a judge, he had this house built with only one bedroom, he and his wife lived in the first floor, in all the living quarters, and everything above that was a big ballroom for entertaining. They loved entertainment, but they didn't want anybody staying in their house except for them. First people to cross paths on the Salala were Clusa, Tequesta, and Caribe Indians. They were not fond of each other. In fact, they often did battle here. And once those battles were over, because of the stony ground, they were not able to bury their dead, so they would just leave the bodies behind and let Mother Nature do the work for them. Ponce the Honor in 1521, claiming the island for Spain, discovering it was littered with bleached human bones. He named the island Cayo Pueso. In Spanish, that means Bone Island or Bone Key. 1763, the British had Cuba. The Spanish had these islands, and they traded. Once that trade was over, the Brits were here. They had no idea what Cayo Hueso meant. Instead of asking somebody to guess, turning Cayo to Key and Hueso to West, it wasn't accurate, but obviously it stuck. It's not accurate because there were 1,800 islands in the Florida Keys chain. The westernmost of those is Garden Key, 70 miles west of us. Garden Key is one of eight small islands collectively known today as the Dry Tortugas, originally named Las Tortugas, and the turtles in Spanish by Ponceon in 1513, because all the sea turtles that were there. Later, the word dry was added on shipping maps because there's no fresh water available, and that way ships were not running around trying to figure that out on their own. Garden Key is also home to Port Jefferson National Park. Port Jefferson is the largest brick structure in the Western Hemisphere with 16 million bricks. Piracy was a problem around Key West as well with Blackbeard, Black Caesar, and others. The big warship station here couldn't catch the pirates. The pirates had smaller ships that would hide in the shallows. Commodore Porter arrived in 1823 with his mosquito fleet. Small, fast ships able to chase the pirates in the shallows and then just do away with them. Mr. Henry Morrison Flagler is a man who is very important to this little island. It's also extremely important to the history of our country. On a national level, Mr. Flagler is important because along with Johnny Rockefeller, he founded Standard Oil Corporation, which is why I like to say they were a couple of refined individuals. Mr. Flagler was important to Key West because he owned the Florida East Coast Railroad that ran from Jacksonville to Miami. When Mr. Flagler heard about the construction of the Panama Canal, he knew extending his railroad to Key West, would allow him to get cargo to and from those ships, and then get that cargo up and down the East Coast before anybody else. His railroad, mean, mean building his railroad over 106 miles of open ocean of mangrove islands. It took 42 bridges to do that, the longest of which is the cleverly named Seven Mile Bridge. People called that idea Flagler's Folly, and pretty much everybody said it couldn't be done, but Mr. Flagler was never one to back down to a challenge. It took seven years. It took $30 million out of Mr. Flagler's own pocket. In today's dollars, that would be nearly $1 billion. Mr. Flagler did through the naysayers route on the 22nd of January 1912 when he rolled into town the very first train and changed the face of this little island forever. Mr. Flagler died just a little over a year later, 1913 and 1918.